All right, hello everyone. My name is Lily Anderson Messick and I work with the Florida Native Plant Society. I'm the Torea Keepers Director. I can't talk about milkweeds without talking about the monarch butterfly because they're the reason that milkweeds are getting so much popularity and press currently. And the reason is because monarch butterflies are on the verge of extinction, at least this population is. Their numbers are drastically reduced to what they historically have been since we've been able to track them. And um, they're being petitioned to be uh, listed endangered, federally listed endangered species. They're not yet listed, but hopefully they will become listed. And so lots of, um, lots of agencies and individuals are recognizing that the monarch, one of the key survival um, issues with the monarch butterfly is a uh, lack of native milkweed populations in the U.S. or dwindling native milkweed populations in the U.S. And um, many agencies are now putting money and efforts and education, increasing na native milkweeds in natural areas and encouraging people to plant them in their yards and gardens. I'm going to show this slide several times because I want to reiterate it many times because it's a really empowering message in a time when you know, we see all sorts of things happening environmentally and we feel kind of helpless and hopeless about, I can't save the polar bears, but this is a species that we really can save. And in doing so, we can actually save many other species because if we protect habitat for monarch butterflies, then we protect habitat for all of the other flora and fauna that exist to coexist with them. And that's a lot of area and a lot of species. Monarchs, I believe, and I think that they are becoming, they have the potential to become a, an ambassador species that really represents conservation and preservation of native plant habitats, um, just like the sea turtle did with the oceans in the 90s when I was growing up. So some of the threats that are facing monarchs uh, are the, in the south, which is in, in Mexico, they overwinter there in these forests of the specific type of tree called an oyamel, and it's a conifer. And this tree has become, the wood has become very valuable in the Chinese market. And so it's being logged aggressively and illegally. And it has become a serious issue because despite us being able to support monarchs in the north up here in the US, if they aren't able to overwinter successfully, then their populations will still continue to decline. And I, one thing I should mention is that this population, monarchs are native to many continents, but this population, the populations in the U.S. are the only ones that migrate. This is a tropical butterfly that has evolved to move, migrate, which is really unique. And they migrate up north into the United States from Mexico, where they're you know, originally existed, and they follow the milkweeds north and then come back down to overwinter because they cannot survive the winters in the United States. It's too cold. In the U.S., there are a lot of issues that they face, but the big one is loss of habitat due to degradation of habitat and development. Here's a sign. You can see it circled. There's a native milkweed right there that will likely be lost when this property was developed. Another issue facing them is the loss of this common milkweed, Asclepia syrica, in the Midwest. This is a very robust, aggressive, or weedy species of native milkweed. Um, it's not native to Florida, but I mention it because it has a big effect on uh, monarch populations. And um, this species was really common and really critical for uh, migrating monarchs. Uh, it is a predominant species of the Midwest a really beautiful plant, but farmers don't like it because it competes with their crops. And since the 90s, when genetically modified food crops became more and more prevalent, they were, these food crops were genetically modified in order to be resistant to herbicide. And so farmers can use Roundup or other herbicides aggressively on their food crops and kill plants like the milkweeds that persisted around them but not kill their plants. And so it's caused massive losses in native milkweed populations. Here you go, you can see this photo on the right, although it's a little blurry. It, um, 
shows lots of Asclepias syrica growing interspersed with corn plants. And that was really common to see them all along um, inside the corn rows, um, canola, other you know, mass produced crops in the US. And now they don't exist. There are very many, many fewer individuals. And that's a lot of uh, vegetative loss for, to produce, for monarchs to reproduce on. The other issue, one of the other issues, especially for Floridians that need to be aware of this issue is this thing you've probably heard of called OE. And it's actually a protozoa. <clears throat> Ophiocystis electroscura is the genus and species, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But it is a parasite that evolved with monarch butterflies. And so this is not some kind of non-native threat that just suddenly appeared. This is a parasite that evolved with the monarch and had a delicate balance with the, with the monarch because if the monarch doesn't exist and dies out, it also dies out, right? So it's not beneficial for a parasite to kill its host, but human interference, including climate change and the introduction of non-native tropical milkweed, which we'll go over, has given this uh, protozoa an advantage and it is um, causing the mortality rate of monarchs affecting the virus like, to really increase. Just like humans carry all kinds of parasites, parasites are very common in nature. And just like um, with human parasites, you know, you can carry lots of them and, and still be very healthy. And monarchs can carry a number of this protozoa without it really affecting them. But at some point it starts to affect their health and because this protozoa, this parasite has been given this unnatural advantage, their numbers are increasing and it's beginning to really affect the um, numbers of monarch caterpillars. This is a little bit of the life cycle here. Monarchs that are affected with OE are going to be much smaller. Their mortality rate is much higher. They look kind of sickly. And you, if you've ever raised any monarchs, you've probably seen some um, emerge from their chrysalis looking kind of small or crumpled looking um, and not in a, in able to pump their wings up and fly. And it's likely that they were infected with OE. They also, even if they are able to survive and fly, they are much less likely to survive the migration south. So here are some symptoms to look out for for this OE. Um, Again, it's a parasite that evolved with the monarch, but has, we have been giving it an unnatural advantage because of climate change and because of the introduction of tropical milkweed, Asclepius cursavica. Um, and <clears throat> if you see a caterpillar with kind of black sooty spots on, on its skin, uh, that can be a sign of an OE infection. Or as you can see, if the chrysalis when it gets close to uh, merging, will often turn completely black and then rot, and that's a sign of OE infection. And also, as you can see on the right hand of the screen, um, even if a butterfly emerges and looks fairly healthy, healthy, one sign of infection are the white bands being kind of indistinct and the abdomen being slightly misshapen. And again, adults that do survive, if they have too much of a load, they might survive and migrate south, but not make the return migration. Is tropical milkweed killing butterflies? This is a big question and a highly debated one, and I'm just giving you my personal opinion. So tropical milkweed is native to Central America. It's not native to the US, but it has naturalized, as you can see the range map on the top right of the screen, it's naturalized in Florida and has become an invasive species in much of Central and South Florida. And many governmental agencies are recommending not to plant this milkweed, especially in areas where we don't have regular freezes, where it can continue to reproduce and form monocult monocultures in natural areas, even out in the middle of the Everglades, et cetera. This milkweed, the real issue with it is that because it's a tropical species and our species in Florida even are not tropical technically, it doesn't have a natural senescence period, which means that it doesn't naturally die back and go dormant in the fall and through the winter. And so 
the um, OE, the parasite, can accumulate on the leaves. And when, whereas our native milkweed, the parasite might accumulate them on them during the growing season, when they die back to the ground, the plant is essentially cleaned of the parasite. And so it doesn't, it doesn't come back on the new fresh foliage in the spring. There's no, oh, there's no parasite on it. This plant is also, it's pretty much one of, in most places, it's the only milkweed species that's available for purchase for home gardeners. And so it's been a, you know, a difficult balance because so many people want to support monarchs, but they, all they can plant is non-native milkweed. And in my opinion, at this point, I feel like um, I agree with many other agencies and nonprofit organizations that it's better to not plant milkweed than to plant non-native milkweed. And again, that's my personal opinion. There's some new evidence that suggests that just the chemical composition of it with the interact, when mil monarchs interact with this non-native milkweed, they, it tricks them into thinking that they are already in Mexico and they may not migrate further south because of that. And then they die when it freezes in the winter. So there are a lot of effects that are always unforeseen whenever we introduce any plant, animal, et cetera. And we are suffering and seeing the effects of this one. So planting milkweed for monarchs is important, but keep it seasonal, plant native milkweeds only. And if you have non-native milkweed in your yard and you don't want to get rid of it, cut it, the least you can do is cut it back. So cutting back all your milkweeds around Thanksgiving is recommended and cutting the, it throughout the growing season. If in your, you're in an area where there's not frost, then cutting it throughout the, sorry, cutting that throughout the winter season to prevent um, monarchs from interacting with it. Again, the tropical milkweed, Asclepias parasophica, it creates an infestation of this parasite and it spreads this parasite and is actually hurting the monarchs as a whole. Also, one of the issues is people raising monarchs year round and raising them in small areas where the um, protozoa parasite can accumulate. The more I learn about this, I've been raising monarchs for, you know, 14 years and it's so much fun and it's such a great educational experience, but it also is very unnatural. And so if you can keep them outside and, and allow them to have normal interaction outdoors, it, it is preferable. I think that it's really valuable for educational purposes for kids to see the metamorphosis process, but all of us who think that we're raising tons of monarchs and aiding them in these cages, et cetera, are, can actually be hurting them. Here we are going, moving on to the milkweed finally. So monarch lives depend on milkweeds and Florida has 21 native species of milkweeds, which is a lot. We are a biodiversity hotspot for native milkweeds. We also have additional species within that same family. As you can see here, Gonolobus natalaeus. I can't pronounce this cynacum, anyhow. Uh, females, they can detect with chemoreceptors on their feet. It's, they can essentially smell milkweeds. And so the more milkweeds in one area, the more able they are to sense them and uh, lay their eggs on them. And so monarchs and the monarch and milkweed co-evolution is a really interesting one because milkweeds ha have this toxin in their sap called uh, cardiac glycoside. It's a type of cardinaloid, which makes them toxic to, the, to most predation, makes the milkweed toxic to most predation. And so a lot of herbivores and other things won't eat them. But the milk monarchs have evolved to withstand being able to eat this toxin and they evolve to accumulate and sequester the toxin in their body so that they, the more they eat, the, the bigger the caterpillar gets, the more toxins it sequesters in its body and the more toxic it is to predation. So it's very advantageous for the monarch to be able to evolve to eat this toxic chemical and to, it prevents predation from a lot of predators. Monarchs, of course, again, are vul very vulnerable to the loss of native milkweed species. The less milkweed individuals and less species available, the more we'll lose monarchs. 
So here's a little bit about the flower structure of milkweeds. They're really interesting and it's a good way to be able to identify a, a milkweed is they have this common flower structure, which is they have these large hoods that come up as you can see here. And you typically inside the hoods, you can see horns that stick up inside the hood. And then they have these reflex petals that are called a corolla. So here's a close of uh, Asclepias virigula, one of our native milkweed species. And as you can see, it's a stigmatic slit here. And I could go on for a lot, for a whole talk just about milkweed pollination because they have a really interesting and unique pollination process. But suffice to say that it is difficult for them to be pollinated. They And it also is very uncommon for hybrids between species to occur because of their complex pollination process. And my friend Mark Tanzig from the, our Leon County, um, from Leon County UF Agricultural Extension Office sent me this map this week and he was like, have you seen this? This is so cool. And I actually hadn't seen this. And it's really neat to see we are living, as you can see this blue area in the panhandle is a hot spot for milkweed diversity, Asclepias diversity. So it, we're in a really, living in a really neat place to be able to experience Asclepias. The majority of the region's milkweeds are confined, confined now to roadsides and power line easements. A lot of the historical vouchers that were collected of these plants, even as recently as the 70s and 80s, no longer exist. And it might, it might not even be that the area was developed, but fire suppression is a key cause for the decline of dwindling milkweed population. The majority of the state of Florida is fire adapted habitat and would have burned on a one to three, one to four year re regular return eventually. And so when we started suppressing wildfires in the 40s, we started degrading our native habitat and a lot of native herbaceous plants like milkweeds were lost and still suffer from that. Often these species are now relegated to roadsides and other disturbed areas that are mowed frequently. And often, sometimes wildflower enthusiasts, you know, are really anti mowing, but mowing at, at the right return, right um, season and uh, in the right intervals is actually really necessary if we're not burning whole areas. And so Mowing is always better than herbicide use on roadsides, which will kill these species that are just hanging on on roadsides. But it's one of the reasons, it is one of the main reasons why we've lost so many of our native milkweeds. Here's a little bit about the monarch migration. They, it's not one butterfly that goes all the way from Canada in the summer all the way down to Mexico. It's generations move up and down. So it's really interesting and they don't know, really know how these butterflies know how to do this. In the spring, they start moving north and that's when we begin to see them. And so our early spring species are super important because they are feeding the returning populations. And so those, the survival of one of those butterflies is going to mean exponential growth of that population, right? This species, the Sleepius humistrata, is the first one to come up in early spring, in like April. And um, it is very, pretty common in the panhandle, a little less common in central Florida, but it is the species that we are really focusing on to try to conserve and and protect and reintroduce into the landscape because it's really critical for migrating monarch populations. There's a picture of my feet there with one very large mature Asclepias humistrata sandhill milkweed. And um, as you can see, this milkweed has really beautiful, unique leaves with that pretty venation. And this is like a lot of our sandhill species, this is likely a very long lived plant. And could potentially live for hundreds of years. I'm not, we're not really sure exactly, but they definitely are slow growing and they persist and can live for a long time. This species in particular, all milkweed species have varying levels of that toxic uh, cardiac glycoside that the monarchs sequester and use in order to avoid predation. 
And so this disease in particular has a very high concentration, which is kind of good because it makes even those young caterpillars a little more toxic to predation. But there is, because of that, there's a high mortality rate. The butterflies, the caterpillars, they still will die from eating too much of it if they do receive too much of the, the toxin. It's a constant, you know, evolutionary arms race. And I'll mention right now, and this is an excellent book about the coevolution of monarchs and milkweed by Anna Rag Agrawal. It's called Monarchs and Milkweeds, A Migrating Butterfly and Poisonous Plant and the Remarkable Story of Coevolution. So back to Aspepius humistrata. This photo was taken early second, second day of April, several years ago. Again, caterpillars have figured out adaptations to avoid eating too much of the toxin. And you might have seen this happen before. They'll take a bite out of the stem of a leaf in order to prevent more sap uh, pumping into the leaf. And then they'll eat the diminished, uh, the leaf with diminished sap in it. They also will tend to prefer the buds and flowers of this very toxic species because it, it hypothesized that the flowers have less uh, of the toxin in them. And here are just a few photos of some of the variations of coloration found in the species. Sometimes they're very pink, sometimes they're very pale, sometimes they're totally white bloomed, but they all kind of tend to fade to this yellow color as the blooms age. And there's a little, you can see this little delta deal in, on the screen here. This plant is also a really important nectar source for many species of insects, especially beetles and bees that, that come out in early spring and there's not as much food available then. If you start photographing native plants like many of you probably already do, you start to notice native insects and become interested in, our, in them. And this is a longhorn beetle that is sipping on nectar from the hoods of this milkweed. So many people want to be able to buy this milkweed and plant it in their yard to help monarch butterflies, right? Well, we've run into a lot of issues with milkweed propagation, especially with these sandhill, very dry, sandy soil occurring species, like sandhill milkweed, because these species tend to be very slow growing and slow to mature, which means it takes them a long time to flower. And they can be particular about the substrate wet soil they grow in and growing them in pots has become a, a real challenge because they have very deep tap roots and they go straight down. <laughs> so these, these plants, um, they live in very dry areas and they are adapted to regular fire return as well. And so, if they, before they start putting out a lot of leaf growth, they uh, start establishing a root system. And so they have a very deep root system that can be very difficult to transplant them. As you can see, they, they have to dig straight down. Growing them on a larger scale has proved tricky to do. And they're not quite as adaptable for typical home gardens, which have more organic matter in the soil. So hopefully we will, and lots of people are working on this issue and hopefully, you know, there are more plants becoming available and one day you'll be able to buy them and plant them. But in the meantime, I'll mention the plants. I'm going to go over all the native milkweed species, but I'll mention the ones that are well adapted for home gardens and talk about those quite a bit. But this is not, <laughs> not one of those yet. This species is another sandhill species that occurs in very sandy soils. And it's the one on the right there that Scott Davis, many of you know Scott, he is holding a sclepius. Oh no, actually that looks like Humistrata in it, in that photo. Anyhow, a sclepius tomatosa has very deep tap roots that go straight down as well. It also has a high concentration of cardiac glycosides and it's a beautiful native milky species here. A few photos of the plants. And again, this is a slow growing species, so it takes a long time for these plants to bloom. You can't really expect to like get a seedling and then have blooms in three years. That might not happen. It might take much longer. They, it, it's been variable between, very, these species are very variable in, in between individuals as to their growth rate. 
longleaf milkweed is Flutia's longifolia. This is one of my favorite species. It's just so photogenic. It's a beautiful plant. It also has the potential to become a good plant for home gardeners because it is adaptable to quite a bit of varying soils, varying soil pH, and varying soil you know, substrate type of consistencies, whether it's moist or wet. Or, they tend to occur in more moist organic rich soils that typically are more um, alkaline where there's limestone, but I've seen them in a lot of different places. And they, because it's not one of these sandhill species, it's much faster growing because it doesn't have to put quite as much energy into putting in a deep root system before it grows. There's a picture of me on the left. So you can see the kind of scale of the size of the plant. It doesn't get super tall. It's only a couple feet tall at maturity. But the blooms are just, and the blooms are very small. It's actually really easy to overlook if you're walking down a power line like I was. You could easily overlook it because the blooms aren't super noticeable. But when, upon closer inspection, they are just beautiful. And you can see a little mantis on that bloom in the bottom part of the screen there. Green antelope horn, Asclepia spiridae. <clears throat> this is a species that is much more common further north, but it's pretty, pretty uncommon in Florida. It is fairly slower growing and tends to occur in nutrient poor soils. It's really gorgeous. It's one of my favorite species, but it's slow growing. So right now it's not one of the ones that are really being focused. I mean, Florida native plant growers are focusing on all of these native milkweed species, but they're especially focusing on the ones that are a little bit easier to propagate and to grow in average home gardens. So um, unfortunately, this is not the easiest of them. Large flower milkweed, Asclepius condomens. This is a beautiful and really unreal looking milkweed. Milkweed diversity in the way they look is just incredible. They have, there's so much diversity in shape and form and color. And even between, even within a species, there's quite a bit of diversity. This is, this species has these super enlarged hoods, which are these big things that you're seeing here. And it's, they're big flowers. You can see my hand there for scale. And they occur in wet prairies and savannas. Usually they're, they occur with Saracenia species or other native lilies like the um, Lilium casei. This one has the potential to become a plant that could be grown at home. Pineland milkweed Asclepius obovata. <clears throat> this is a really beautiful, interesting native milkweed. And this plant is actually being propagated currently by some nurseries in Florida and sold at retail. But again, because it's we're at this point where growers are trying to get enough plant matter, seeds, and cuttings in order to provide the very high demand for native milkweed, it's still hard to find a lot of these native milkweeds because there's such high demand for them and not a lot of supply. So this plant tends to occur in the western panhandle. It does occur in Leon County, which is where I live in Tallahassee. I found plants in part of the Apalachicola National Forest that is in Leon County, but they haven't been vouchered yet. And here's some variation in morphological differences between individuals within this species. This plant on the left was from further in the western panhandle, and it had really reddish colored hoods. And then this plant on the right was one of the plants I found in Leon County, and it is super was super tall for an obovata, and it has that kind of more common pale green color. Here are a few more beauty shots of these beautiful milkweeds. Red ring milkweed, Asclepius variegata. This is also a plant that is being cultivated and sold uh, by native plant growers, and has has a lot of potential for home gardens. It's on the slower growing side, but it is adaptable to quite a few types of soils. I've seen it occurring in pretty clayey, heavier soils and also sandier soils. And it is fairly adaptable to part sun and shade, although it's not going to bloom quite as prolifically in shadier areas. 
And the common name red wing milkweed comes from, at, you can see at the base underneath the hoods, there's kind of a reddish purpley ring. And that, there's a lovely picture of how pretty it is, but you can, this plant, this individual had a really colorful one. And so that's a good, I, when I first saw this plant, I was very confused by its common name, red ring milkweed, because it's white. But a lot of them do have that kind of purpley red ring. Few flower milkweed, <clears throat> this is one of the more common native species that you see on roadsides, especially wet ditches along roadsides. And it is a fairly large plant. It's fairly fast growing. It has the potential to become a really good choice for home gardens, even though it's a little lanky and odd looking. It is be currently being grown and propagated. These are poor picture, poor quality pictures, but they show you just how tall these plants are and how long and linear those leaves are. So there's my hand on the right side. And you can see how it's just one stalk that comes up and then has just a few flowers at the top. These are blooming now on a lot of roadsides. And this species is often confused with the tropical milkweed because the coloration and the shape of the flowers is very similar, but those leaves are very different than tropical milkweed leaves. So that should be the uh, identifying feature for you. And here are a few different color variations in the flowers. Swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata. This is my top choice for home gardeners who want to plant milkweed to raise monarchs on and to support monarchs in their yard. This is a um, plant that is adaptable to quite a, quite a few soil types. It is typically found in very wet, mucky, organic, rich, wet soils but I have grown it in like an average Tallahassee, slightly clay yard, and it has done really well. So yeah, it, so it's fast growing. It has a lot of leaves. There's a photo of me on the left with some of the plants. They get very large, so they provide a lot of leaf matter for growing caterpillar. And if they get eaten back by a caterpillar, they re-sprout and grow back fairly quickly. So one of the issues with buying this plant though is our florida plants we have found are are likely genetically quite different than the populations of the same species that occur much further north this is a very common species up north but when i have purchased seeds from northern seed stock and grown them here they grow for one year and they don't come back in the spring there are also quite a few noticeable differences in the plants and so I think right now they're deciding whether this is our plant our incarnata is actually a unique subspecies it's definitely different and so getting plants that are grown from Florida seed stock is very important in all native plants but especially in milkweeds too aquatic milkweed is sweepies prunus this is another plant this one and the swamp milkweed are the top two that I would recommend for people to grow in their yards and gardens because this is a plant that is pretty adaptable to a variety of soils and situations. This one in particular is fairly tolerant of less sun and it will grow in forest and very wooded areas. It will grow in, in water, in wet, mucky soils, and it occurs in water, but it also will grow an average soils that are fairly rich in organic matter. This is a much more smaller plant though than the swamp milkweed, the Asclepias incarnata, so it doesn't provide quite as much leaf matter, but it, like the incarnata, it grows back very quickly after it's been munched back by, by caterpillars and it, it'll re-sprout and keep growing. Here are some differences in ecotype. The plants on the left are grown from Central or South, South Florida seeds, and they have much more narrow, narrow linear leaves, and the plants are much more compact, about a foot tall or so. Whereas that's my leg on the right side there. This is a much taller native plant that was occurring in along Highway 98 in the Panhandle of Florida. The ones in the Panhandle tend to have wider leaves and tend to get taller even if they're growing in full sun. So one of this, this, this individual species is a, 
it has a few differences from our other native milkweed species. And one of the differences is that the seeds don't have the little white fluffy things that are called comas that aid in seed dispersal by wind for milkweeds. Once a milkweed pod, once the seeds ripen, the pod opens up and those little comas catch the wind and spread the seed very quickly, which makes collecting milkweed seed for growers difficult. But this species does not have the comas because it grows in wet areas where it relies on water for transport of the seeds. So the seeds are bare and this plant produces prolific seeds. It, and it's possible most milkweed species that we know require two separate individuals for cross-pollination. If a insect takes the pollen from one plant, one flower on one plant and moves it to another flower on the same plant, it doesn't usually produce seed. But for this species, it's, it's hypothesized that this plant could be self-fertile and that it is able to pollinate itself. So it produces copious amounts of seed, so that makes it also more readily available for home gardens. There's a picture of me standing in a cypress swamp and there's a aquatic milkweed growing right out of the water there. And I've seen monarch caterpillars on twigs in the middle of a cypress swamp that, that have munched down this milkweed and then they're, they, they can't swim. So they kind of get screwed <laughs> sitting out in, a, in the middle of the water like that, but you know, that's nature. And there's a, a beetle there feasting on some aquatic milkweed. So this is another unique factor with this species is that it seems to not die back in the winter. It sometimes dies back some, but will usually re-sprout in the winter. So that's one of the issues that could aid again in the accumulation of that parasite, the OE parasite. So here are some photos that I've taken in the winter and it's not good or natural to have monarchs here in January that early when we are in North Florida, we're prone to freezes and it's likely that they'll die. Cutting back the species and cutting back all of your milkweeds around Thanksgiving is always a good reminder and then trimming it back periodically to keep it cleaned of the OE parasite. So Asclepias tuberosa, we have two subspecies in Florida. The most common one is Bar Ralstii. And this is a plant that has, it's very fairly fast growing. It occurs in sandier soils, but it doesn't have that extensively deep root system. It does have quite a tuberous root system, hence its um, specific name but it is pretty fast growing and can even bloom in the first year grown from seed. And it can be fairly adaptable to different soil types. I've also seen and heard from people who have grown it that it, it can be pretty tolerant to saltwater intrusion. I know a woman who planted a lot of these plants previous to Hurricane Michael and then Michael inundated her whole property, which was on the coast, and the plants actually came back, which is really neat and makes sense because they occur a lot along the coast. Not actually on the coast typically, but again, this plant is native all throughout the United States, not throughout, but across much of the United States. And so having, acquiring plants that are grown from native seed stock are very important. And another thing we've learned is that plants of this species grown from cuttings are usually annual, whereas Asclepias perennis and Asclepias incarnata, the swamp milkweed and aquatic milkweed can be grown from cuttings and they become perennial. This one can be grown from cuttings but doesn't tend to perennialize. So that's important to know, it needs to be grown from seed or root cuttings. And it's always preferable to grow native plants from seed because you want to have genetic variation to make keep the species more flexible. And this species also has no latex. It's one of the few milkweeds that when you break a stem or leaf, it has almost no, none of that white sap that comes out. And that sap is what carries that toxin. And this plant has very little amount of the cardiac glycoside. And so often the monarch butterflies will not 
prefer it because they want to eat that toxin in order to make them safe from predation. But again, as I mentioned before, the toxin amount in milkweeds can vary between species and can vary even within populations within a species. So <clears throat> monarchs, I, I assume, adapt and prefer and choose plants that they need depending on what they've already been feeding on. So lots of genetic variation in Asclepias tuberosa, and here's just some beautiful variation in the bloom of this plant. I love, one of my favorite things about native plants is getting to see the natural variation and color forms and blooms. One of my favorite things. Oh, and here's a little video. I have this, this plant in particular is often visited by zebra swallowtails, which do not use it as a larval food, but they love the nectar of this plant. It, and it, this plant all, often occurs along our native pawpaw species, which this butterfly does use as a larval food. Just need to see all the multiple uses of this plant, how it is, how these species are important, not just as larval food, but as nectar sources too. Class B milkweed, Asclepias amplexicalis. This is one of the sandhill species that has a pretty deep taproot, but has been successfully propagated and is currently being sold by native plant growers. Although again, it's very hard to find because there's such high demand and very little quantity currently. This is a slow growing plant though, and it often takes many years to flower. But once it does, it's very spectacular, it can get very tall. Here's a picture of my friend Erica and I, we went for a bike ride out in the Munson Sandhills, just south of Tallahassee, and we came upon some of this class B milkweed. And it's a tall plant, that plant is about five feet tall, about almost, pretty much as tall as I am. So there's a lot of color variation in this plant as well. In the panhandle, you often see these darker pinker variations, but it's also common to see it in a pale beigey pink or greenish variation as you see on the left here. And it's called class B milkweed because I don't know, you can't see exactly well on this, but on the right hand side, you can see the, the leaves of the plant do not have little stems. They have, they clasp and touch the stem of this stalk, flower stalk, and actually kind of touch each other on opposite sides. And so it's called clasping milkweed because the leaves are clasping. World milkweed is Sclepias verticillata. This is, a, it's a fairly common species of native milkweed, but it is not common to see mostly because it's easy to overlook. It's a diminutive plant, although sometimes they get fairly tall, but usually it's about a couple feet tall. It has these kind of greenish to pale white blooms, and the leaves are very unnoticeable, kind of needle-like. And it's called world milkweed because the leaf pairs are in a world around the stem. So it has multiple leaves all around the stem of the plant. There are probably two subspecies of this plant that occur in Florida because they're found in different areas and in different habitats. The one that's found in the panhandle is typically, it's in sandier uplands and is, you don't, you see a few sparse plants here and there, but in central and south Florida, you, you usually see this plant in wet prairies and it can be clonal and none of our other native milkweeds quite form colonies the way this one does in south Florida, but not really in the panhandle. So it's likely that they're two subspecies. And this plant is native all the way to New Mexico. And I was out there a few years on a trip and I ran into an Asclepias versus a lot of out there. And it, it's the picture on the right is from New Mexico and you can see the difference. Well, you can't see it very well, but the plant in New Mexico is much more robust than our native species here. Red milkweed, Asclepias rubra. This is a really beautiful native milkweed. It has an exceptional exceptionally beautiful coloration. It's all, they almost glow in the summer sun. They bloom in the summer around July, right around my birthday. They only occur in the western, far western panhandle of Florida. 
I live in Tallahassee and it's about a three hour drive to see these plants. And so last year was the first year that I got to see this one in bloom and I was so ecstatic to get to see it. This is a taller plant, but it doesn't have, and it doesn't have a whole lot of leaf matter, but it would be a good choice for potentially growing in home gardens eventually because it's faster growing than the sand pill species and likely more adaptable to different varying soil types. But because it's fairly uncommon in Florida, it's difficult to get mat plant matter for people to grow and propagate. Carolina milkweed, this uh, Ascobia cinera, this is a very diminutive native milkweed that is super tiny. And when it does occur, you see lots of them typically, but it is one of those species, like most of our species, that really relies on fire, regular fire returns. And I, whenever I see lots of these plants, it's always right after a prescribed burn. I included this photo with my accidental finger in here just to show you how tiny these blooms are. They're very tiny, the plants are tiny, and there's not a lot of leaf matter on the plants. So again, it's probably not the best choice for home growing if you are trying to support monarch caterpillars. Those, though monarchs will eat them, it doesn't have a lot of leaf matter to feed them. They're tiny plants, but beautiful and worth growing, certainly nonetheless. Florida has two endemic species of milkweed, and they both occur in Central and South Florida only. They don't occur in the Panhandle. And I had planned to get to see both of these species blooming this year, and then this pandemic happened, and I haven't gotten to be able to go see them. But hopefully I will get to be able to see them soon. And my friend Scott Ward kindly gave me photos of his so that I can share them to you guys. Curtis's milkweed is Curtis Curtisine occurs in scrub habitats and it has these oak-like leaves. The leaves remind me of the Asclepias tomentosa, the velvet leaf milkweed, and that they have that kind of wavy leaf margin and they remind me of little oak saplings. But again, I've never seen them in person. These are photos that Scott gave me and I look forward one day to being able to see this plant. Again, this is highly, the, this species is highly dependent on regular fire returns to the landscape. Florida milkweed, we already had a whole Lunch and Learn, Native Plant Society Lunch and Learn talk on Florida milkweed by our wonderful Kara Driscoll. She's an awesome, an awesome botanist who is studying this plant right now. But again, this is another endemic species. I have yet to see this one. Hopefully one day I'll get to see it. And it, it is also very dependent upon regular fire returns to the landscape. It's very hard to see and spot because when it's not in bloom, as you can see on the photo on the right, it's a very diminutive plant and could easily be overlooked. So one of the things that might be associated with, with many plants that are hard to see, often they are overlooked and they might be more common than we think they are. Savannah milkweed, Sleepius pedicillata. This species is, I would say, probably the least showy of our native milkweeds. It's short and fairly low growing and has these really different looking blooms that um, rather than having the petals be reflexed, they're up, they cup up. And it's not completely uncommon, but again, like the Asclepius fei, it can be difficult to see and so it's often overlooked. Michaud's milkweed is Asclepius michoui. This is not uncommon in longleaf pine, wiregrass ecosystems and is it's a low growing species that is often kind of hidden in the wire grass like this individual was. I think that this species has a good chance of becoming a good choice for home growing at home because I, it is a little bit faster growing than some of the other individuals. And you can see here some varying colorations in the bloom. Green comet milkweed, Slivius viridiflora. As you can see, it's very uncommon in Florida. It's much more common further north, but in Florida, it is very rare and only really occurs along in our limestone glades in the northern panhandle there. It has some unique blooms with these kind of diminished hoods. The hoods are all the way back underneath that main, well, I won't go into all the specifics of the blooms, but 
and it has extremely reflex petals, so hence the comet-like appearance of it. Southern milkweed, this is almost a Florida endemic species. It occurs in only one county in Alabama and, and in, in, only in Florida otherwise. And it is typically in wet prairies where Dericinia and Asclepius conovens, the large flower milkweed, often occur. And it is a really beautiful but diminutive plant that, again, is easy, easily overlooked. And so that those are all of our species. I could talk about a lot of different, I could go off on a lot of tangents, but I wanted to reiterate again that that what you add or remove to your yard really matters and has rippling effects within the, the ecosystems that exist in Florida. And so planting native plants and planting native milkweeds are, are really important and critical. And I recommend everybody do that and I'll play this little video. So I, I, will, I can answer questions now, if Valerie, if you want to ask anything. Okay, there was a question about identifying milkweed plants when they're not in bloom. That can be very difficult because as you've seen in this presentation, they have a lot of different leaf shapes and sizes. And unless you are pretty experienced, that can be very hard to do. When they're in bloom or when they are in pod and they have those long follicles, they're called follicles, which are those long seed pods, they can be a little easier to identify. Um, and most milkweeds do have that white sap if you break a leaf or stem, but other plants like euphorbias also have that white sap. So it's very difficult to ID a lot of plants when they're not in bloom because, you know, flowers can be key diagnostic features for plant families. There was also a comment about pre butterfly preferences for different milkweed species. Yeah, so they tend to prefer milkweeds that are higher in toxicity, but Sometimes they prefer other ones, like usually they don't prefer the butterfly weed, the Asclepius tuberosa, but then usually they'll lay eggs on other plants before they lay eggs on that one, in my experience. But then some years they suddenly lay all their eggs on the tuberosa. So it probably has a lot of variables as to what they prefer, but they tend to prefer the plants that are higher in toxicity. The Asclepius curasavica is a favorite of theirs because it, it is fairly high in toxicity. The Humistrata, Tomentosa, and they do really love the Incarnata and the Prinus, the aquatic milkweed and the swamp milkweeds, the ones that I mentioned were the top two for home growing. Also, there was a question about commercial variability in different regions, Palm Beach County, and then frustration that all of these species are not available commercially, and how do we support growers of these milkweeds? Yeah, so it's happening, but there is such a high demand that growers cannot currently meet that demand. And there's, again, like I've mentioned, a learning curve with how to grow these plants because a lot of them can be very specific or slow, specific in their needs or very slow growing. So as I mentioned, the plants that the Asclepius crinus and Asclepius incarnata are the most readily available native species along with Asclepius tuberosa. And those are all great plants and fairly adaptable to most gardens. And so I would recommend those. And I would also recommend, you know, contacting your Native Plant Society, your local chapter. And there is a Florida Association of Native Nurseries. They have a wonderful website called plantrealflorida.org, I believe. And they, um, you can look up different native plants and then see a list of nurseries that may carry them or have carried them before. So again, everybody's in the same boat of wanting more native milkweed plants and not being able to get them because there's just not enough, to, there's not enough matter to meet the demand. But one thing you can do is, you know, supporting your native plant society, which is involved in a lot of efforts for preservation and and eventually propagation of these plants, but also just continuing to ask your local nurseries to carry them because pressure from the consumer is how how products are changed, right? So the more you say, I don't want tropical milkweed, I don't want a Sleepius curasamica, I want native milkweeds, the more hard they look so that retail nurseries will say, okay, everybody's asking for this plant, so then they ask their wholesale growers who are actually growing the plants 
do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? And then those wholesale growers are the ones who are who then say, oh, well, there's enough of a demand. I I will make the effort to try to start growing this plant, which is kind of finicky to grow. So there are several wholesale growers that are really starting to grow more and more native milkweed species. And it is happening. It's just not fast enough for all of us. And if you're, I mean, everyone here is a member of the Florida Native Plant Society. There are two chapters that have excellent growing programs of local ecotype plants. Cocoloba chapter, which is in Southwest Florida, and then Pawpaw chapter has the petal pushers in Volusia County. And they, they have a nursery and they grow locally adapted plants, including milkweed. So we have two models for you to follow, and I'd be happy to loop anyone in with the people that are currently doing it so that you could start a program like this in your own Native Plant Society chapter. Yeah. And I will say, resist the urge from digging these plants in their native areas. We, those plants that use salt dug were part of road widening, saving them from areas that were going to be developed. But letting them be where they are is really important. You can collect some seed. Don't ever collect all the seed from all the plants in a population or all the seed from one plant. Collect some seed and you can try growing it, but be really careful about and so many of us want these plants but it's really important those plants that are still persisting in their native habitat are really important to let be so <clears throat> just putting that out there Rodan would like to know if you get some seeds is it better to broadcast them or try growing them in pots and then transplant them well like i mentioned we have 21 species they're all variable in um and the type of soil they grow in and the pH that they might prefer. So it can vary. Um, in general, unless you have to transplant them, it's probably better to grow them in, in the spot that that they that you want them to grow in. So direct seeding them into the ground, in my opinion, would be preferable if you already know where you want them to grow. But for growers to be able to sell them, they have to grow them in pots, so they do especially these sandhill species with long tappers, they do not like being grown in pot, pots and they tend to grow much quicker if they're direct seeded in the ground. Madeline asked, she said, thank you for answering my questions. I have one more. Since a lot of the milkweeds need disturbed areas, is mowing the best way to achieve this in a yard less than an acre or would turning the soil occasionally be just as effective for disturbing? I would say mowing because turning the soil is, that's not something that happens all that often in nature naturally, but the mowing mimics what fire does for a landscape. It takes out the woody shrubs that would pop up and shade out these plants. So yeah, mowing is definitely preferable. Tyler says, with the monarch potentially being added to the ESA, Endangered Species Act, I'm concerned that the potential restrictions will be put in place and people will not want to plant milkweed in order to avoid these potential restrictions. I was curious, in your professional opinion, how can we continue to ensure slash incentivize people to plant milkweed? I think there is already a great desire and incentive for people to plant milkweed. I think the message we need to, the tweaking we need to change in the message is planting native milkweed and it's happening, but there is a wave of people who are very excited and in the monarch butterfly is just a charismatic and endearing plant uh, species. And many people want to do something to help it, right? It, that's across all backgrounds and, and all over the nation. So I think that, I don't know that that is an issue. I think that in my opinion, of course, I live in a kind of a bubble, but I think there are lots of people who want to plant milkweed, native milkweed, but they don't have the plant matter in order to plant it. It's just not as available yet. And that's just something that is happening slowly because it is difficult and complicated. So yeah, I would say, I think it would be very beneficial for the species to be listed, for monarch to be listed as an endangered species because it could protect and man we, habitat would be more managed for them. Just like with the red cockaded woodpecker, a lot of native milkweeds are thriving in red cockaded woodpecker habitat because they're burning it on a management plan. So I think it would be a good thing for it to be a listed species. I mean, it always comes with a lot of difficulties and negatives as well, but overall it would be beneficial.
Greg would like to know, to what extent do you think that the spatial distribution in the virtual atlas database, which is referring to the Florida plant atlas, is an accurate representation or are many species present but just not vouchered? I would say that there are definitely some species present that aren't vouchered. I know that I personally, I have not done the work to voucher plants and I know that there are plants in, in counties that they aren't vouchered in. But I would also say that it's more likely there are more plants that were vouchered in counties and now might be extinct from that area or almost extinct because a lot of the historical vouchers are from like the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And now there's been a whole lot of development and fire suppression that have happened since then. So uh, a lot of the plants that are, were vouchered are no longer in existence. I'm going to chime in again to say that if I'm looking to find a plant that I'm not sure is there, I always check iNaturalist because they have more up-to-date information about what plants are, might be yeah. in a certain location. And I will also say that I don't share locations for rare plants or plants that are highly sought after by people like native milkweeds and carnivorous plants. And when I do um, report them to on iNaturalist and upload them, I obscure the location so that people can know the general area they're in, but not the specific exact location because I have seen individual plants of native milkweed species across many different species being poached in native areas. You know, the plants that occur around Tallahassee, I have visited them all the time and I know a lot of them very well. They're like friends almost. I see them a lot and it's heartbreaking for me to to lose plants that were persisting in well-managed habitat and all of a sudden there's a hole in the ground where they once were and so i it, it's it's a real bummer to not share locations and to tell someone oh it's in this general area but there's a reason for that because there are a lot of people who don't know better and if they can find a plant or they just have such a desire to want to try to grow it at home that they dig it up and then that's very detrimental to the species as a whole just losing that small amount of genetic variation so deborah has a question about recommend recommendations or suggesting for growing your own which i feel should probably be a separate lunch and learn i mean that could be a several hour lesson there's just so many and there's so much that we're learning and we still don't know about the best ways to grow many of these. And so we're really in this kind of dark period. Because there's, there are species that we have a lot of experience with, the ones that I've mentioned many times, Incarnata and Perennis, Tuberosa. And there are some species that we're learning more about, but the Incarnata, Perennis, and Tuberosa, those are all very easy to grow. You can grow those. If you know how to take cuttings, you can grow them from cuttings. You can grow them from seed fairly easily too. But yeah, they're all, they're just so many, we have so many species and they're all pretty different. Yvonne would like to have you comment on giant milkweed. That's not a native species. So I don't grow that and I, and I have never, I, I, I grew it once, but it died in the winter up here in North Florida. And I don't know the effects of if it has any detrimental effects. If it doesn't die back, which I'm assuming it doesn't in Central Florida, it could also accumulate the protozoa that can kill these um, butterflies. So cutting back all milkweeds around Thanksgiving and can clean them of that protozoa. But again, I always prefer planting native species. I think we don't know all of the rippling effects of inviting non-native species into our yard. It has so many effects on so many different things. And the more we can recreate native habitat in our yards and gardens, the more we can sustain all wildlife and biodiversity. And that means having a healthier environment for all of us and having you know, clean air and clean water and all of the other things that ecosystems healthy functioning ecosystems provide us. So planting native plants is really important. It's important for all of us. And um, I could give a whole talk on <laughs> just that. Mary would like to know if you know of any other insects that are dependent on milkweed and are even more rare or more threatened than monarchs. I, do, 
there are many different insects that are obligates to milkweeds as well. And this is a book that if you're interested in other species of insects that use milkweeds and are found on milkweeds, because once you start growing milkweeds, you notice that they have regular visitors that you don't see on other plants. And it's called Milkweed Monarch and More, a field guide to the invertebrate community in the milkweed patch. And if you're interested in those other insects, definitely get this book. This is a great book on, because there are other butterfly species that use milkweeds as well. I don't know of any other insect species that are more or as threatened as the monarch, but it's possible that there could be. I'm just not an entomologist. Also, very few people are looking to list insect species. It's just, it's yeah. just not, if that's not happening, no matter how rare they might be, it's just not happening. Yeah, and insects, if they're not showy and pretty, like butterflies are very overlooked and undervalued, and they are extremely important. What about the vine milkweed relatives, such as Mavalea, Gonolobus, and Sarcostema? I have seen what was identified to me as soldier larvae on Sarcostema. Yeah, monarchs do use them, although they do not tend to prefer them. And yeah, I didn't go over them because this is mostly about milkweeds rather than milk vines, but we have several genera of, well, I think we have three or more genera of native milk vines, they're called, which are in the milkweed family, but they're vines and they have pretty different looking blooms, although they're kind of similar in their flower structure. And yeah, I I mean, I could go, I mean, I could give a whole talk on that. Looks like we have several more topics for Lunch and Learn. <laughs> so Donna says, even if monarchs don't love tuberosa, so monarchs do lay eggs on tuberosa and they do use it for nectar, but as Lily pointed out, they don't have that much glycoside, so we're not always preferred. She asks, yes. are there other butterflies pollinators that do love it? I've definitely seen queen caterpillars on tuberosa, although I see them more on perennis and incarnata, especially perennis. And certainly pollinators love tuberosa. I mean, tuberosa is one of our more common occurring species, and it's also one of the more florific. I guess it blooms a lot. And for often blooms in the spring and then again in fall, at least in the panhandle here. And so, yeah, it provides a lot of nectar for native insects. And like I showed that little slow-mo video of the zebra swallowtail butterfly nectaring, I always see zebra swallowtails on tuberosa flowers. They love tuberosa. And lots of other butterflies and other wasps and bees and all sorts of insects. I think the key is you plant the milkweed that works for your location that you can get a hold of. What is your yard like? Not, oh, this one's not good for butterflies. I shouldn't plant that one. Recreate yeah. the ecosystem rather than picking and choosing based on what we know of current insect-plant interactions. Yeah. So one, plant native, and then two, plant for your site. So if you have full sun, then a lot more of these native milkweeds are adaptable to full sun and prefer full sun. And then you have to consider your soil. Michael asks, should we dig up our tropical milkweed all at once? Speaking for myself, the more I read about the subject, the more I find that it is causing harm to monarchs as a whole. You might be saving one butterfly or five or 20 or 500 even but you are weakening the species. And so in my opinion, I don't grow tropical milkweed. Also because it's an invasive species in Florida. It's not listed, but it is certainly in Central and South Florida an invasive species. And I am noticing it spreading in North Florida too. So to me, that's up to you, but I don't plant it and I don't allow it to grow in my yard. You could replace it with native milkweed and then dig it up. Yeah, and we face this conundrum, which I know all of you are frustrated about, is like, but I can't find native milkweed. <laughs> and again, you know, the Xerces Society, they say it's better to not plant milkweed than to plant tropical milkweed. So, yeah, hopefully we are doing all we can to propagate and grow more native species and Keep harassing your local nurseries to grow it, and they will 
harass their growers to grow it. So not don't harass them. I don't want to say that, but just keep asking for it. And I mean, this goes straight into generalized anxiety about Susan says, I'm wondering how many plants might be enough. Start to get worried. Am I, am, do I have enough milkweed? I think that it's easy for us to like, w humans tend to get in, we want to mother these butterflies, you know, and like try to save them and protect them. And, and really just planting native milkweeds, what you can plant, if you can plant three plants of any native plant, it's always better than planting one. The butterflies will be able to notice and smell the plants if there are more of them. And the more individuals you have, if they were grown from seed, the more genetic variation you'll have, which is good for the species and good for seed production. You'll be able to produce seed if you have more than one individual. So planting three is ideal, but if you can only plant one, just plant one. It's okay. It's better to do plant one native plant than plant no native plants. Do what you can and trying to um, protect the butterflies from the rea harsh reality of nature. You know, I totally understand and I am guilty of it, of like, you know, wanting to protect them and trying to coddle them along. But in what I've learned is that in reality, you're, you're weakening the species the more you try to kind of coddle it. So doing what recreating a native yard, recreating natural ecosystems, restoring them is what we can do to save the species. So just planting more native plants in your yard. And even the, there, I could do a whole talk on just flowering wild, native wildflowers that are necessary and useful for nectaring for monarchs. There are several species. Goldenrods in the fall are really important. Liatris and saltbush. Bacchus species, they, those are very useful resources for, and necessary resources for nectar for migrating monarchs that are going south in the winter. Yes, if you receive the most, the upcoming palmetto, Craig Cuba has an excellent article about using native grasses. So Beth says, as much as you can grow and want to have in your yard is enough. Yeah. Milk. And that really, that goes to could you have a whole yard full of goldenrod? Yes, but the flower stalks are going to flop over because they're not being held up by the grasses. So create a healthy ecosystem and always include milkweed. But your, yeah. you know, the amount of milkweeds in your yard with your soil conditions, moisture conditions, and your species might be very different from someone else's yard nearby. And you don't need to get uh, worked up about that. Yeah, there's no one set palette of plants because there are so many different ecosystems in Florida and so many different habitats um, and species, but biodiversity in your yard is important. So doing what you can to increase the diversity of native plants increases, you know, the diversity of insects and wildlife that your yard can support. Lydia Cooney with the Fairchild Trop Tropical Botanic Garden thanks us for our recent support. And they're looking forward to recording observations and cultivating the native ecotypes of the rare milkweed species here in Miami for butterfly gardeners, native plant enthusiasts, and are off to a great start. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. If uh, anyone would like to get involved in citizen science regarding milkweeds, you can take observations and obscure them, please, on iNaturalist so that other people don't know where they are exactly. And um, we can see them. We have a project that curates them automatically. If you're looking for a specific species to look at right now, we have a project with Kara Driscoll on Sclevis fei, Florida milkweed or Florida fairy milkweed, and uh, it's blooming now and is about to end. So if you really need to get out and do something that matters right now, go look for this plant and you can contact Kara or you can contact me. I have I have the maps and I can direct you to locations to look for, look for this, this plant species. Beth would like to know, do milkweed seeds need cold treatment in South Florida? Kara says no. Yeah. Okay, that's all the questions. We've gone way over. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm so glad that so many people are interested. And, you know, again, plant native is the most important thing. And a diversity of species, native species, is the most important thing. And spread the word. Tell your neighbors, your friends and neighbors, and be really kind and not scolding about your native plants. Be very inclusive and we can get more people on board and, and make big changes.